Welcome everyone to this web talk on data literacy and AI in primary education. Um, children are often said to be more exploratory and learn faster than adults, especially when it comes to the use of technology. And I personally can attest to that um, when my colleagues and I were talking about the way that children use technology and especially interact with voice assistants on their phone. Um, we talked about how they joke around and one of my colleagues wanted to show a little trick that her kids do when interacting with Ziri. But unfortunately, the three adults in the room couldn't quite figure out how to get her to talk back to us aloud and how to activate her, actually, um, which might mean we at the German Informatics Society could use some data literacy and AI literacy training as well. In this talk, we want to explore what age-appropriate curricula and learning activities for primary students look like and how the new generation can, uh, can be a fit for the digital world. My name is Caroline. I've been working at the German Informatics Society for two and a half years now, and I currently lead the Climate Data Entrepreneurial Club that focuses on data literacy in young adolescents. Um, while most of my work at the GI is focused on young adults, I'm very excited to dive into primary education today together with our wonderful guests. Before we start, just a little bit of housekeeping. We have about an hour together with some buffer at the end, so there's enough room for questions. Um, we will start with a small input and then head into our discussion. And we also strongly encourage participants to ask their questions in the chat, and we are looking very forward to them. We also encourage sharing some interesting resources or materials you might have uh, to make this an exchange not only of ideas, but also of valuable resources. And we've also asked today's speakers to provide some of their favorite materials. And this event will be recorded and published on the German Informatics Society's YouTube channel. This web talk is part of the Train BL project and funded by the European Union in the Erasmus Plus program. And the uh, program itself focuses on teacher trainings for data literacy and computer science competencies. And the team consists of 11 organizations in Austria, Germany, and Lithuania. And they develop educational concepts for data literacy and artificial intelligence competencies and embed them in teacher and school education. I'd now like to welcome our guests. And first up, we have Pat Young Credit from Code.org and Teach AI. He's dedicated to promoting computer science education and as a national voice on the K 12 computer science education, his passion is to bring computer science opportunities to every school and student in the United States. Throughout his career, he's also been a computer science teacher, so very in the field. And uh, he inspired students to create mobile games and apps for social causes and implement initiatives to broaden the participation, especially among underrepresented groups. Hey, Hi, happy to be here. And I think there's also the first uh, resource in the chat already. Next up, we have Professor Dr. Ute Schmidt. Ute Schmidt is a professor of cognitive systems at the University of Bamberg. And for more than 15 years, she's been offering workshops for children as well as teacher trainings and is giving hands-on experience in computer science in general, as well as artificial intelligence more specifically. And among many other accomplishments, Ute Schmidt has provided a course on data literacy for primary schools for the KI campus. And one of the main concerns is to empower girls to develop their interest and talent in the field of computer science and find their voice in, in the computer science field. Hello, Ute. Hello. Next up, we have Dr. Georgi Dimitrov. Georgi is responsible for the Digital Education Unit in the European Commission, Directorate General for Education and Culture. He joined the European Commission in 2008 and has since worked in many different roles, one of which was the development of the Digital Education Action Plan. Thank you for taking the time, Georgi. Hi, thank you for having me. And then last but certainly not least, uh, Professor Dr. Valentina Dagide. She's a principal researcher and professor at the Vilnius University in Lithuania and also part of the uh, Train the Elf project. Uh, she's head of the Department of Education Systems Groups and her research interests include computer science education research and STEM education, among many others. And Valentina has kindly agreed to give us an insight into the Train the Elf projects and specifically uh, the efforts that, that have been made uh, towards teacher trainings and share a little bit of her experiences as well as findings. Um, and I don't want to take up more of that time. Valentina, floor is yours for an input, and then we'll head into our discussion after. Hello, everybody. Now I'm going to share my slides. So I hope you see. Yeah, you see my slides? 
Yes. Yeah, okay. So now I will start a little introduction. So as was was told that uh, I'm uh, in the Traindale project, I'm interested on primary education and uh, how to introduce uh, uh, artificial intelligence and especially data literacy for primary school uh, teachers at first, because we teach teachers that they can teach uh, their pupils. And uh, so this is, uh, I'm from Lithuania, from Vilnius University, and uh, what we are lucky that uh, we, our government started to uh, upgrade, update our uh, informatics curriculum uh, like three years or, uh, ago, and I was involved in this uh, uh, updating informatics curricula, and we, we are lucky that no informatics is introduced from uh, grade one, it means in primary education, and we focus uh, in our curricula, we focus on computational thinking, and of course computational thinking involves uh, in data literacy and, uh, and uh, AI. So this is our curricula in the, uh, one slide, just uh, that is uh, the informatics curricula in Lithuania for grades one to 12. It means covering from primary school to lower secondary and upper secondary school. So, and uh, the same schema, of course, the content is um, different, but uh, the same schema as uh, you see the data mining or you know, data literacy and information is the one part and uh, AI is included in algorithms and programming. So this is, that's why we, for us, it's very important to, to work with, uh, uh, in this project with uh, Germany and uh, with Austria and to, to develop, uh, uh, at first to develop some resources and then methodology, how to teach teachers and how to teach uh, pupils. So we had more than 10 workshops or seminars with primary school teachers in, uh, uh, in uh, different places in countryside, not only in, uh, in the capital Vilnius, we had uh, only few, but we, we travel in countryside and did with, uh, with teachers and and uh, also we um, had one workshop in our uh, both from Baltic countries in Estonia also with Estonian teachers. So that we, we in these workshops uh, participated more than 150 teachers and uh, future teachers. We involve also students who will be future teachers, and we uh, collected all um, like uh, comments, and that we can uh, improve this methodology and improve uh, res uh, some uh, resources. What is really uh, our teachers' request? What we noticed, we can there is and my conclusions, but at first we notice that with primary school teachers it's very important is to start from data from data literacy because usually uh, teachers are interested in AI because now it is modern and everybody wanted to know and pupils asking teachers that they need uh, but not only to tell concept but they need to understand and you, if in order to understand you need to uh, to do these activities, hands-on activities, to do some things that they can play and uh, uh, doing by hands, especially these younger uh, pupils, and that they were uh, uh, they were very interested in like material, for example, here in picture, even this photo, you see that we are playing with this uh, data sorting and data uh, pattern recognition, data sorting is very important because then we will uh, introduce them to data and then we go can go to machine learning and, uh, and uh, or, or AI. So, for example, we have some like pattern pattern recognition, for example, like with uh, some wrapping paper, for example, and it is really that uh, uh, like seven years old or that six years old uh, pupils like to do and uh, to find some patterns and we can also to introduce that this is that is what computer doing and uh, uh, but with many uh, large scale and much faster and it is the data data can be not only like uh, uh, numbers but also some images another example of these activities for example is this like a decision tree we can call and this is uh, from uh, actually from a Bebra's uh, um, challenge from Bebra's challenge that is run in 78 countries 
countries and we have many, many uh, exercises, um, many tasks, is tasks from, for example, like uh, two years ago that you, you need to click on the animals that need more than three questions before we can identify them with this decision tree. So it says there is this interactive task and uh, we have many interactive tasks and some and then the software that uh, pupils can uh, play and then teachers can explain about them these concepts what what is behind these tasks in the playful so I, I put in slides some explanation because you will get uh, participants can get these slides and you can see more about uh, this decision tree for example like to read I, I am not going to read here because it's limited time but uh, I put this some explanations and uh, for example these cards are uh, uh, it's like Ligretto, if you know this game, but it is we made this as our original uh, game because we wanted to integrate also mathematics. That's why in one side there is um, like mathematic shapes, circles and triangles, and, uh, uh, and the students can also sort by these geometrical shapes, by numbers. Uh, and uh, by colors, but we also uh, put this PDF that uh, schools can print not only uh, color and uh, that so that's we put this um, pattern for the, there is pattern like turtle and uh, and kangaroo and uh, beaver or babras uh, babras in Lithuanian. So that uh, they can sort for them these 160 cards. They need to sort. You can ask in 16. Uh, piles or in less, and it is very good for group work that we notice that teachers are so enjoying the doing, discussing, and and as I told that it is really very good for pupils to, to because they can, for example, if you work in group of four, you can get several strategies, and then and you see you can make just contest also like competitions that in how many minutes go, and then after you can ask or we strategies they use and it's really interesting to observe how they uh, investigate different strategies and then can share but it is in these cards for example they you can download from this uh, pdf just print simple on on a for paper cut and 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 do with students this all gaming and i told that this is like a ligretto uh, similar but ligretto is more it uh, can be uh, played in different way, but you can uh, do with Ligretto cards. Activities to introduce uh, to AI, that is also we can combine uh, uh, like uh, unplugged activities and also plugged activities like a uh, uh, teachable machine or so that it, it depends on uh, uh, if you going with computers in computer labs and, and but you can uh, do also with some <clears throat> Babras tasks. For example, here we have an example just from 2017, as you see, there is uh, uh, it means that uh, already six years ago, this is a task developed by Germany, uh, from Germany, Bebras, uh, Bebras um, um, also association. And uh, here is uh, one of examples that this such kind of tasks we can develop more. And this is, we agree, for example, what is uh, smile detection, and we can talk more about smiling faces, and we can also draw, ask pupils uh, to draw and and then we can uh, ask how many smiling faces for example are detected on this image on the image on the uh, left side and uh, and then we can explain what is wrong and not wrong actually actually with this teaching if uh, on online version you can use a teachable machine and also to 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 play with students so such such type activities are really very 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 suitable for primary schools uh, he is about also about this informatics and one more game that is already uh, in a trained L. We we use this game for also lower secondary school and in Germany for um, also with informatics teachers and uh, it's it's suitable for uh, for primary school as well because we can ask. Um, 
And here you see this uh, common creative licenses is developed in AI Unplugged. And uh, there is about uh, task is about uh, monkeys, uh, which monkeys bite and which monkeys do not bite. At first, we agreed with some examples. And uh, for example, here is training data on the left side and then test test data. And we need to, uh, to um, dis discuss because it's not each clear. Uh, students need to decide which uh, uh, which aspects are or features are important, for example, closed eyes, not closed eyes, or uh, smiling or teeth, and can be discussions. And it's some some are clear that can bite, some are clear do not bite, but some as are on the border. And with uh, uh, all the students, you can talk about probability and uh, go far further. But for, for younger students, maybe it's, it's enough like to, to discuss these features. So what we suggest for primary school teachers that is uh, uh, we really uh, <clears throat> recommend that to first to start from data, from data analysis or data mining, because we at first uh, two years when we started two years ago, we started with uh, AI because teachers, uh, primary school teachers also request, and we started with it seems a very simple game with this uh, three uh, three uh, uh, with nine nine cells game like, uh, but it's uh, it's really uh, hard hard for them to understand why it is needed and especially when you need one hour to and uh, you primary school teachers usually do not have uh, any computer understanding except some maybe teachers but usually then data is more convenient for them because with data you can meet in everyday life and when we started from data data mining pattern recognition then we introduce these concepts and and then they can un start to understand how machine learning works the data is important and when we have a lot of data we can learn from data and this is good connection that we learn from our our site that um, before introducing AI, you need to talk about data. And of course, it depends if some like, well, very strong teachers who already passed some courses or so that you can. And uh, in primary school, also, we need this many, <clears throat> this many uh, gamification elements because primary school pupils, they, they usually uh, play some games and we should combine this uh, unplugged and plucked uh, uh, and some especially short games because sometimes especially like seven years old they do not have uh, patience to play longer and it's um, uh, in the lessons you uh, you should provide uh, some uh, um, short short these games and this is Bebra's uh, challenge Bebra's tasks uh, and we need to develop them more that teachers can focus on like three five minutes uh, usually and what Bebra's is uh, um, developed uh, to have uh, from three to five minutes uh, tasks or exercises, it's a, and you can play interactive. If you have online version, you can drag, drop, or select, or some. If you have on, on paper, you can solve by pencil. But this is short tasks, and we should develop them. They really good, and teachers like, and they told some schools uh, experiment, of course, with pupils, and they very very good uh, reflections that the students also like and and uh, to use. Also, I, I, I mentioned that this, for example, this like uh, uh, from Google Teaching Machine. Uh, some of the uh, teachers uh, uh, tried, and uh, and. Uh, that's all I think. If you have questions, I would be happy to answer. So thank you. Thank you so much to you, Valentina, um, for sharing some interesting tasks and methodologies that you can use um, to get teachers acquainted, but also then, of course, teach kids about uh, data and AI competencies. And I think we'll dive a little bit deeper into the why, what, and how in our discussion now. I'd like to start with the way that kids conceptualize and understand or think about artificial intelligence. And during our preparation, uh, we came across a drawing contest. I think uh, the, the 
resource will be in the chat in a second. Um, Ute can talk a little bit more about it and also correct me if, if I'm wrong, but little drawing contests and kids were asked to draw an artificial intelligence system and the way they think about it. Um, and it's very interesting what they drew and maybe Ute, you can explain a little bit more um, what we saw in the pictures or what you found in the pictures and then also what that tells us about how kids think about artificial intelligence in general. Ah, yes, thank you. So we came up with this uh, drawing competition for primary school kids in the context of another project where we were concerned with uh, trustworthiness of AI. We had this project where we, the whole university and region of Bamberg um, read uh, Rebooting AI, the book from Gary Marcus, right? And um, in the context of uh, this more general project, we tried to address several stakeholders in Bamberg, where I'm from and the region. And we also wanted to address children. So we came up with this idea and we were really excited when we got more than 60 drawings from children of class two to four, so aged seven to 10 approximately. And when you look at this small selection of four images at the link, um, which was provided in the chat, you see very different uh, ways how children think about AI. So one typical thing is to have uh, the embodiment of an AI system as a robot. When you, for instance, look at this robot cat with lots of different functionalities inside or the, the robot helping children to cross the road. But we had also other ideas um, like this KI image on the top left with lots of different modules to offer assistance in different ways. And on the top uh, uh, bottom right, this kind of flying robot, which is um, a helper robot, which uh, robot which can also uh, support when a child is, child, child is hurt, for instance. So this is very uh, anecdotic evidence now, very unsystematic uh, because it was in this competition, but we currently are conducting a more systematic study um, with children from class one to four in primary school, where we identify several domains um, which are typically related to human intelligence and human agency, like um, cognitive aspects, motivational aspects, emotional aspects, always three simple questions per category. And the children have a choice from a doll, a cat, a child, an adult, a smartphone, an AI robot, and so on, a choice out of eight different things. And children are always asked, select who of these, for instance, can feel pain or is angry when uh, something happens, stuff like this. And um, we are very interested how the conceptualization, what an AI system can and cannot, um, changes from this very young age of four or six to 10, because in this time, children uh, spend a huge amount of uh, cognitive development, especially. And we see also at adults uh, with the background not in computer science and AI, that we anthropomorphize, difficult word uh, to pronounce in English, very often AI systems and kind of transfer our conceptualization of human intelligence to AI systems. And I think this is one of the problems we, we need to address when we teach uh, primary school teachers as well as children. And I think uh, what uh, Valentina showed us as the unplugged material is one way um, to give children more insight in how, let's say, decision tree learning works or other things. And then you could do the next step and relate these 
taught algorithms to how humans learn, yeah? and could discuss similarities and differences. For instance, one crucial error, and uh, uh, Caroline, please stop me because I tend, when I talk, I talk, yeah? But uh, one um, a crucial error is that, for instance, when you have a trained model, which is recognizing different animals, children as well as naive adults tend to think, wow, this, uh, machine learning model can perceive. So they are very astonished when they tell them that this system trained for animals will not recognize vehicles, for instance, that you have to learn a new model, right? And that these systems typically also don't have what humans, um, what we call metacognition in humans. So when you would present this model, which learned animals, a washing machine, uh, a human would say, oh, what is that? I never uh, saw something like that. The machine learning model would probably return, this is an ice beer. Yeah, because lots of white in the image. Huh? Yeah, thank you. That's very interesting. I also wanted to dive a little, and you already mentioned that, into the misconceptions and biases that kids have when interacting uh, with uh, or, or thinking about artificial intelligence and anthropomorphism of the, the embodiment is, of course, one uh, one aspect. Um, I actually, I studied uh, artificial intelligence uh, as well, and then quickly moved back into cognitive psychology. Not to say that psychology uh, is somewhat less or more hard than artificial intelligence, but it was a study that required a great deal of abstract thinking, I'd say. Um, and I, um, I can only assume that concepts have to be broken down quite a lot to be able to teach them to young kids. I don't know, Pat, if you'd be up for a little challenge, so to say, but if I'd be a primary kid, how would you explain artificial intelligence to me uh, in, in a couple of sentences? You, you gave me the hardest question of the whole entire panel. <laughs> uh, um, so I was actually asked a similarly hard question, maybe a harder question. One one person once asked me on a panel, how do you explain computational thinking to a, um, a primary school student? And I told them, imagine that you had um, a robot next to you um, and you wanted to tell this robot to do certain things. And this robot can't just understand you know, your your normal language, you have to create a language that the robot will understand and then use that to do to have the robot do things for you. Now, everything that you thought about in terms of creating that language and then instructing that robot, all that thinking is called computational thinking. Now, obviously, any kind of research scientist would could poke holes at that um, operational definition for uh, a primary school student, but that's the best I could come up with. And in terms of artificial intelligence, I would say, I would say this, I would start the same way. There's a robot, you know, because you have to make things physical for primary school students. There's a robot and they obviously understand a robot's not alive. It's not, um, and it, they understand that it has something, it's electronic, it's digital. And I would say there's a robot. Now, artificial intelligence is when, <laughs> people teach that robot to do things that you would normally uh, be able to do and, and think about. Now, obviously this, this is where it falls apart because uh, we know that artificial intelligence is, is much more complicated than that. Um, but the idea in the end, you know, when you see, you look up a definition for artificial intelligence, even on the internet, it always relates it to human intelligence, human intelligence, human intelligence. And it talks about, you know, mimicking human behavior or learning and adapting. If uh, it's very hard to talk about artificial intelligence with a primary school student, maybe with a, let's say a, a lower secondary student, let's say like a 12 year old. I would say, hey, you know about computer programming? And they say, they, hopefully they would say yes. I would say, you know how when you computer program and you, you tell it exactly what to do and then it does it? Well, artificial intelligence is different. It's computer code that learns off of data 
uh, and performs outputs without you telling it exactly what to do. So that's 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 what I would share for an, an older crowd as well. Thank you so much. Yeah, I agree. It was a very hard question, but um, I think you taught me a lot about what I studied um, and then uh, switched back to psychology, as I said. Um, you said it's uh, incredibly hard to um, start early and teach primary, especially a primary student about artificial intelligence because it is quite a complex topic. Um, but maybe to Valentina, would you say it is still worth it to start that early? Where do kids encounter artificial intelligence in their everyday lives and why is it necessary to not teach them how to use it, but actually what's behind it? I think that kids anyway will ask teachers. They they learn from some like parents and they are talking, media talking and all, and they're asking these questions as what was uh, teachers telling that like five years old already asking what is machine or what is learning, what is they, of course, we need to, do, to um, give them some uh, answer like to give space that they can think also. That's why we we wanted to give some like games that they can start it to understand a little what what is behind because not only that like it can be like similarities with the internet or with mobile phones or can be also when we start with computers that from one side they use something when from other side we give like small like Seymour Papert mentioned that like bytes like information that you can bite with your mind for, for this age that, that that's why we uh, discussed with teachers and we suggest these small tasks like three minutes to keep attention and one another and one when they ask more then we can explain and they can feel this how machine learning how robot is and, and how, how robot can understand words or how pictures or especially the smiling for example we haven't so for people it's really very easy to it's smiling or not smiling person but uh, for when you wanted to tell robot what is smiling you need to think about details and then we can uh, discuss with these cards. What is smiling? Is it smiling when only lips or more? Or what is? And we agreed on this. And I think that it is. It's uh, we couldn't avoid these questions. That it means children asking. If they are asking, we need to provide and something a little deeper. Not only to tell some like what is this, but uh, but uh, to to allow them to play and to especially to create to investigate. What like for example with teaching teachable machine you can investigate or with some Bebra stars also you can play and drag and put in the right place and it's for for children it's really very uh, important to support this creativity that they can think and they can teach machine and they will be prepared to teach robots to teach machine in in uh, and we haven't yet mentioned that ethics is very important we should start these ethical issues from very young age to talk what is good was not good because we all know that it's how it's important if we uh, teach many bad things of robots we can get very ugly uh, our world but we need to discuss with children also these topics yeah that makes a lot of sense especially when interacting with uh, children like as, as curious natured people i'd say um, to teach them very young it becomes very apparent that that is necessary i think um, Georgi, does the European Commission also recognize data literacy and AI competencies as part of early education? Um, or is that something that comes up later maybe? And also a little bit of a twofold question since interaction on the, um, on the European side is not really regulatory, but maybe more cooperative and more um, uh, more uh, yeah, sharing ideas and interacting and connecting. What are kind of the leverages um, that you and your uh, day to day life have and the European Commission have to um, to further that agenda? Yeah. Well, let me and let me start by the second question um, because uh, I will introduce another <laughs> another sort of concept uh, which is that of subsidiarity. Um, I'm just saying it because it's a very important concept um, to understand what's happening at the European level and also, importantly, what is not happening. 
Um, so subsidiarity essentially just goes to say that uh, the member states of the European Union are responsible for their education and training systems. And in some cases, this is further devolved down, such as in Germany, for example, where there is Bundesländer, or in Spain, where there is autonom autonomous um, uh, regions, and so on and so forth. So uh, you kind of get the level of complexity that we are in. Now, um, with this level of complexity, there is also, from the Commission's perspective, uh, let's say, in the field of education and training, uh, a very clear body of evidence of the last uh, 30 or years or so, which is essentially when the, the EU has started to cooperate on education, because think, think about it. I mean, the EU started as co and uh, steel community. <laughs> and now we are dealing with the AI Act. So just think about that. And um, um, the evidence is very clear that there is a lot, as you said, Caroline, there is a lot of, uh, of um, sort of value added um, in terms of doing um, things together. And um, uh, when it comes uh, more specifically to the field that I work in, which uh, we call digital education for a lack of better term, but it is really a, a very broad concept. This is something which we have been engaged with um, uh, the member states now uh, for a number of years with uh, with a new initiative we launched a few years ago, which is the Digital Education Action Plan, where, where we put a more systematic uh, framework for um, what you need in order to have digital education happening and also what kind of digital skills and competences you, you, you kind of um, want to develop. And uh, before I go a bit to, to the question of, on, the, on what is there from the data literacy and AI um, point of view, maybe in terms of the leverages, there are two leverages at the EU level to make things work in the field of education. One leverage is incentives. And um, this is the program Erasmus. And I'm very glad that you have invited me because you are a very nice example of what Erasmus actually does. And um, the Erasmus program is um, supporting not only mobility of students uh, for which it is better known, but more and more cooperation between institutions and countries. And so one way you can drive change is, for example, through incentives and um, supporting cross-border projects. And um, this is a very important growing kind of category, if I can put it like this. If you look back at the, the development of Erasmus, we see more and more projects in the field of even informatics, AI now in the last uh, few years since I'm involved in this, we have a separate category which we, which we call policy experimentation projects where we really support uh, policy reform between authorities as well as education and training stakeholders. So that would be category one of incentives uh, for leveraging. Category two will be what I would just call more a cooperation, um, um, slash uh, soft law development and um, cooperation because we do have um, standing groups which are meeting at the European level on all the different uh, um, sectors of education, traditionally schools, universities and so on. But we now have since a few years also something on digital education where we more and more address cross-cutting issues. Um, we also have something within this cooperation part, which I call soft law for a lack of better term, but um, which is something which is important uh, because while we cannot legislate, um, we can work together with the member states and help them develop uh, specific uh, measures, which at the end of the day, I have to admit, it's really up to them if they will implement them or not. So we will not go and chase them and say, well, you need to pay a fine. But of course, uh, there is this um, this practice of name and shame, or you know things like uh, you want to be the best in class, or you want to avoid being the worst in class, and so you you kind of you develop creativity when you don't have legislative measures. It's very it's really that. So um, we have now, for example, just right now uh, uh, we are negotiating two council recommendations with the member states. And I can say something about it if you have another question on, on, on the informatics. But um, I want to conclude by just addressing what you said in terms of AI and uh, data literacy. I, you know, I don't want to be very diplomatic. Um, uh, and I will say that we don't have much on, of this uh, on the agenda. And I want to be rather honest. 
And uh, I think that this is really a moving target, which we are now addressing, especially currently in this council recommendations. Uh, we are addressing the questions of what are the enablers of informatics or of AI. And I agree with the speakers before me that data and data literacy is absolutely among those. But the reality is that we don't have um, a very, I would say, substantial frameworks with maybe the exception of the digital competence framework, um, which has some elements of this, but which I think needs uh, perhaps to be uh, taken further in the in view of what we are currently looking at, you know, in terms of the AI discussion and so on. So we are rather at an earlier stage of development, but it's also a bit because of what I've said earlier in terms of the type of leverages um, we have. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that was uh, very insightful. And you already mentioned the first uh, framework, the DECOP framework, which I don't want to dive uh, too deep into different frameworks. I think there are multiple on an uh, international, European and national level, but maybe we can talk about it more in more abstract ways. And uh, I don't know, Ute, if uh, you don't mind just explaining us a little bit what you think kids need to understand about artificial intelligence and data literacy, what are the concepts that are kind of essential, especially in primary education, and then where does it lead uh, maybe the next two, three years into school? Uh, where do you start and what do kids need to learn from an early age? Uh, okay. So um, we heard already a lot about um, data literacy as a foundation to understand one brand of AI, namely machine learning. And um, I think um, so maybe this is due to my background because um, I am a teacher and researcher of AI since back from the 1990s. Um, I think we should also get uh, a little bit, at least, material about different areas of AI. So, for instance, we developed hands-on games for HABA education um, about heuristic search algorithms, like make it a, a competition game, find a good path from where you are to the ice cream uh, shop, and so on. And uh, also about reasoning, yeah. Um, and you can do this um, similar to what we saw, what Valentina showed with hands-on unplugged materials. And um, I think it's always important to relate it back to computers, yeah. The same for basic uh, computer science uh, literacy. I think it's as young as the children are, as more we need um, hands-on uh, analog materials for understanding. But I think to make the connection, what's going on in your computer, you need to support uh, children to make uh, this connection. Um, we didn't address one aspect, which I think becomes crucial in times of generative AI and deepfakes. Namely, we need to get a broader concept of uh, media competency education. I don't know what's the correct technical term in, in English for this branch, which is a classic branch. I know in Germany, uh, there is um, elements of uh, media competency education in primary school, but this is mostly about how to regulate your online times. This is one important. Another is about privacy. Don't give your real name on some website, stuff like this, privacy, security. But uh, what is missing, and I think this becomes more and more crucial, is how do I evaluate outputs of AI systems? Yeah. Um, so I think this is nothing for first or second grade. So Pat is the one with the hands-on teaching experience. And I think um, maybe this would be grade three or four where it makes sense to start something like that. That you give a simple task, ask ChatGPT about uh, how to care for a dog or whatever, yeah? And then you would ask, hmm, how do you know that these are good hints, yeah? 
Um, whom would you ask? Maybe people would say, the children would say, well, maybe um, an animal doctor should know. Yeah. So you could go and interview this uh, animal doctor and compare what the chat GPT tell me and what does a human expert say. And the same for um, deep fake images. Yeah. We could fake Im faked images are around the world since centuries, yeah, <laughs> um, of course. But uh, to make children aware that a certain image might not transport the truth and to understand between what is a fact, how can I verify a fact, and uh, what is an opinion maybe when it's text. I think this becomes more and more important because at least what we see in Germany, and I'm sure this is the same in other places, I think we get a more and more larger digital divide. When I look at adults, when I look maybe at adults who don't have an academic background, um, that we we run in a risk which is really dangerous for democracy uh, when we don't start to educate everybody about how to evaluate things offered us by computers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think you're maybe hinting towards also a, a, a mandatory computer science education that also maybe includes media competencies. I think one big advantage of this uh, panel or web talk is that we have uh, so many people from different countries. Uh, and if I want to ask Pat a little bit what the situation in the US is like, um, what uh, is computer science being taught as a mandatory subject? Is it integrated uh, into other subjects? Where do you start? Can you give us a little bit of an overview of what the, what the situation in the US is like? Yeah, I just put a website into the uh, chat. So co.org does a lot of um, advocacy um, around computer science across the states. For people who don't know, the U.S. has um, over 50 different state education agencies. It's not a centralized system. It's a highly decentralized system, all the way down to the level of the school districts. So, for example, I was in Connecticut recently. Connecticut has about 169 school districts. All of them can make um, very independent decisions um, around uh, academic standards and whether or not, for example, they even ban AI. Uh, one, you know, one school over here, ten miles away, uh, one district might ban it, and the other one doesn't. Um, and that's a whole issue with a, a new digital divide that we're going to see, obviously, due to um, very, um, you know, uh, differing policies across uh, regions. Uh, but, um, you know, the situation in the U.S. is actually, uh, I think, probably pretty similar to the rest of the world. There's no guidance at schools, at the school level. Um, uh, teachers and, and students are kind of left to themselves to figure out uh, how they use AI safely, effectively, responsibly. And that's why Teach AI was created. Um, again, I want to put this link in the in the chat. Oh, oops, teachai.org. Um, so TeachAI just released a toolkit today. Um, it's called the AI Guidance for Schools Toolkit. You can check it out at the website. Uh, it talks about a variety of things, um, uh, including uh, the safe, effective, or responsible use of AI. It provides seven principles for guiding the development of AI guidance. And I wanna be clear about this. This toolkit is not a report it is guidance that other people who will in turn guide schools and teachers would create to start the process towards potential policy development. And then obviously the whole purpose of all that is for improvement and transformation in our education systems. So these principles are things like um, uh, using uh, promoting AI literacy, which the, the toolkit defines as both how to use AI and how it works. And how it works is a lot of what we've been talking about today with data literacy, um, with uh, even statistics and things like that. Very fundamental core things that every kid should know if they're gonna be AI literate. Um, it goes through benefits and risks, but not only uh, listing benefits and risks, 
but also associating them together because the, you know they are they're two sides of the same coin. The same tool could be used to uh, help a student uh, learn a language uh, in the same in the same way that tool could have cultural biases against people who don't speak English. Um, and people should understand like both sides and how to mitigate these issues. One way to mitigate it is to not use, um, AI detection software, which obviously uh, has false positives and lots of false positives against non-native English speakers. So the toolkit's available at teachai.org. Uh, one of my favorite pictures, and I, I just want to share this real quick and and end there, is this picture of a tree. And I think all of our panelists would agree with, with this idea that, you know, there are all these emerging technologies out there, but fundamentally, they're all products of, they're all artifacts of computers and computing. And still in this day and age, even with, you know, now calls for AI literacy, every kid still isn't, it, they aren't getting the fundamental basics of computer science, whether it's data programming algorithms or ethics, like they, they just, they don't get it. So they're expected to live in this world where they're supposed to engage with these emerging technologies, like even maybe quantum computing, but they don't have like the fundamental concepts. And in the end, Caroline, that's that's where we're at in the US and probably in the world. Kids kids still don't, uh, only 57% of secondary schools in the US even have computer science as an option. So, you know, that that's the, that's the situation with a highly decentralized system like the US. I hope you don't mind me uh, just asking a question because you said, mentioned a very decentralized system, which I think is maybe similar to what we look at at the European Union. Um, but if I look at the TJI uh, website, it says you're working towards a global partnership of educators, nonprofits, technology companies, academics, and education agencies. Can you talk a little bit about your process and who you're trying to involve? In, it sounds a little bit like a global strategy you're working towards. Is that right? Yeah. Or... Yes, there are almost 60 um, government agencies participating in TJI right now. There are 34 U.S. state education agencies and about 25 um, national government agencies. These are offices of ICT, obviously ministries of education, but even uh, digital uh, economy promotion agencies like the one in Thailand. Uh, we uh, we just actually had a, a meeting two weeks ago uh, where we brought these education agencies together. Um, and I was just on a call last night with the Southeast Asian Ministers Education Organization. Um, and, um, you know, these, these, these leaders are feel by themselves because they're figuring it out for their country, but they have no one to talk to. They have no resources to share. Um, and they and they really, even if they had someone to talk to in their country, they need to talk to people who are dealing with the same issues that they're dealing with at the federal level. So we bring these people together. We provide them resources. Uh, we're about to have a conference in uh, three weeks where we're bringing international people together to talk about AI and education at the at the federal uh, kind of policy level. So um, it's it's mostly community building resource sharing, and then technical assistance. Thanks. Um, Georgi, you talked a little bit about the different leverages that the European Union has and mentioned that, for example, projects um, are one big aspect uh, that the European uh, Union uses to get people connected, uh, exchanged, uh, exchangement of ideas, also in different countries, get them on the same page. Um, could you elaborate a little more if in your experience um yeah how how successful these projects are um do you see that these these connected uh, projects are working out to get european countries on the same line and is maybe also what pat just explained is that alongside the european commission's mission and is that something that might be interesting for europe as well I think that projects um, work very well in the short to mid term, and uh, it's an inherent uh, part of projects that um, I think whenever they are finished, 
naturally the, um, the interest and the sustainability is, is um, a problem. So I think that projects should never be a um, substitute for a proper a policy intervention or a proper strategy. So I, I think sometimes uh, we policymakers do confuse projects with, uh, with strategies. But um, I think that uh, without projects, of course, you cannot move any more substantial policy forward. And what I mean by this is that, um, for example, if, um, if you want to um, implement uh, curriculum reform, for example, in, let's say, informatics, then it would be very handy, of course, to have some European projects that might support it. And then you can team up with some others who have uh, some different experiences and then uh, take this agenda forward. Um, for us, um, what is very, very important is that um, we also manage to perhaps address some of the fundamental root cause problems um, rather than hope for the project to give a uh, three years kind of respite and, and then, you know, um, have some energy and then die off. Um, I think uh, when we come back to, to the topic of right now, what uh, I'm particularly, you know, excited about is this um, momentum that we're seeing um, at the EU level, especially with one of the two recommendations that we are about to finalize in the member, with the member states, with 27 member states, which also include a very strong reference to the role of informatics. And I think this is nothing short of, um, I, I, I want to be careful with my words because normally at the EU level, you never discuss curriculum and things like this. So um, uh, this is, let's say, going to be a very positive development if it happens. and. Um, I think um, it is important for member states to, to agree that there are certain commonalities. I mean, just like Pat was saying, in the US, there is that many uh, schools and, and uh, states, but the reality is that they have shared problems and they, they do address uh, often the same issues. And it is similar from that point of view in the EU. And in fact, the fact that we're dealing with computer science or informatics, as we prefer to call it here, um, is even better because it's a newer problem. So it's not so embedded <laughs> culturally. And you cannot really claim that uh, informatics is something that in Germany is different than in Bulgaria. I mean, it's not. So, uh, and it's very universal from that point of view, very, very um, um, kind of lent itself to, 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 to work together. And uh, our intention now is to promote this idea that the member states should really consider um, computer science, informatics as uh, part of their, of course, responsibility, that they should devote sufficient time, that they should um, um, uh, hire, recruit, retrain or develop um, uh, teachers, that this should become really on par as the other basic, uh, if you like, um, disciplines, literacy, numeracy. Um, and um, once these type of policies are, if you like, agreed upon at the EU level, we can follow up with the incentives and then we can support it in a kind of mass scale in order to take, uh, to, uh, because it will take a very, very long time. Of course, we, we have no, no doubt about that. But the important message that I want to send here is that um, um, we have seen it also through the Eurydice report, which had a very uh, good data in terms of what is happening in the EU. And it's also very fragmented. Um, uh, but we also have some very interesting data from certain member states which have had uh, informatics for a very long time as a mandatory disciplines. And you can see very interesting um, developments there. For example, uh, the fact that in some of them, the uh, graduates, uh, the female graduates share is way higher than in many, many other uh, countries which have not had ever informatics as a mandatory um, subject. Uh, I mean, it goes up to, to 30% or 40% of some of the ICT graduates that, there are, that are women, which is really very, very positive. And so this is just one benefit of, of this. And Georgie, and, uh, can I share something about that? I was, yeah, of course, I was in, go ahead. I was in the UAE um, like three, four months ago, and I found out that 70% nash, almost nationally, there are two universities represented, but both of them said 70, almost 70% 70 of their computer science um, undergraduate and graduate population were women, and and uh, and they told me, and, and this is another thing you don't know about the people don't know about the UAE. They've made computer science mandatory for years now at the K twelve level. Now I don't know if those two things are related. It could just be cultural. I don't know, but I, I certainly agree with you, Georgie. Uh, 
that the more that um I mean, if you compare countries and, you know, one has obviously been teaching computer science at the K-12 level longer, you're going to see better, you know, equity, uh, gender equity, racial, ethnic equity, everything. So I, I applaud the, um, you know, your group's efforts to to make it a, a bigger deal in Europe. Actually, I just wanted to finish with that point on the equity, because fundamentally access to this type of education, and I want to agree also with Ute on the media literacy aspects, which I think is also a nice benefit of, of, of going to informatics in a slightly, if you like, broader way, in a more inclusive way. I, I think that ultimately we're talking about uh, a human right and about equity. And if we, if we don't do that, uh, obviously, um, many, many people will fall much faster behind. So it's really a question of equity in the end of the day. And uh, for us, as I said, we hope to be able to uh, have the adoption of those two recommendations by the 27 member states in November. And once this happens, um, be sure that we're going to be out and about um, promoting it and uh, and then having some projects rolling out. But we are not yet there, let's say, a, a couple of more weeks. But when the topic came to equity, I saw Ute nodding quite a lot. And I think this is one of your specialties and maybe ties into uh, um, what would like this web talk quite well. The question of um, does teaching kids younger help with creating more equity and also getting young girls interested and help them stay interested? Does that even work at a primary level or is that something that only becomes relevant in secondary and higher education? Mm, yeah, so um, I, I'm really impressed by uh, what Pat and Georgi told us about that when you have computer science established in school, that uh, more women pursue a, a computer science career, because this is definitely not the case for other STEM subjects. So the typical story is, well, I was interested in physics, but then these guys around me, they were really or probably just perceived so much better. So I thought this is not for me. Yeah. Very often it's also the teachers kind of bring in some biases. Uh, um, so I'm really impressed and would be interested in, in getting the, the statistics, which countries these are. Um, so coming back to your question, Caroline. Um, so a research from um, um, yeah, how to retain women and young girls in computer science give evidence. It's uh, not so systematically and broad, the database, but what we see is that the important point is you should start before puberty starts. Yeah, this is important that this happens before. And then you should continue offers in school and also in out of school offers over the property to keep this option um, in the awareness. Yeah. And um, so what I also observe is, but this is also anecdotal evidence that very very young girls and boys, kindergarten and primary school about up to class two, kind of behave very similar, are interested on a similar level in computer science and technology, but already starting in grade three, I see, for instance, when you do scratch programming, this typical thing boys explore girls plan. This is just formulated a little bit strongly, right? Uh, and so also when you do scratch, boys typically program a game and girls program an interactive story. So one problem here is the boys need a variable because they want a score. <laughs> <laughs> For the interactive story, you don't need the variables. So typically, when we do these workshops, we kind of introduce uh, things like, say, to the girls who have this story, let's say the, the witch meets the dragon or whatever, maybe you want to count how often the meet the witch meets the dragon just to motivate also to use variables so in in principle what i want to say is you have to really have gender sensitivity when teaching hands-on programming rather early on 
for uh, not getting this gap because uh, between the boys exploring everything and the girls very often being much more careful and um, do a systematic planning and uh, yeah and the most important message start early before puberty and keep the options aware yeah thank you so much yeah that makes a lot of sense i think we are almost out of time we have uh, a little bit and uh, I'll, I'll stop with a final questions i just want to remind uh, the people in the chat and watching that you can share also resources. I know I've seen that some people interacting already, which is really nice. Uh, if you have anything that could be interesting to the other participants, feel free to share it before we are out of time. Um, I want to circle back a little bit to what the center of Train DL, the project, it is the teachers. And uh, we've talked about uh, curricula and frameworks and quite abstract things, but of course, at the end, uh, we have people in the classroom teaching about computer science and about informatics. And uh, we already touched upon the point that, uh, especially in primary school, teachers might not have to be computer scientists themselves to teach about computer science. And I see Valentina nodding. Um, but what I'd be interested in is to learn how long it takes till the teacher is ready to get in the classroom and teach about um, artificial intelligence and data literacy. How many trainings do they generally need? And um, yeah, are there sometimes hesitancies when trying to get them into uh, teaching about data literacy and artificial intelligence. Sorry, that was for Valentina. <laughs> uh, okay, so we we also discussed among uh, our partners uh, how long does it take, but it depends also on topics. If you start with very light like data, data literacy from everyday life, you maybe it is enough like uh, one, two workshops, like programs, let's three, four hours long for primary school teachers. And some teachers can, can uh, do with pupils, but they need resources. At least in our country, they need that fast end hesitating to produce own exercise and, and you know teachers not many teachers has time to produce own exercises or resources one thing another if you do with computers uh, using computers that at first they need to get uh, computers not each school has access they need to sometimes negotiate to school to find ways and so and not so many teachers are so active I mean, primary school, and especially in Lithuania, primary school is for grade one and one and four. It means for four years, quite uh, little children. So that's about some uh, we have, like maybe at least 30 percentage schools who are doing, uh, going and doing with a computer, what uh, Ute explained you and some other this is, but not all schools. Some teachers, you know, especially some uh, primary school teachers hesitate to start with computers, afraid to show in classroom or some, that's, that's, that's why I uh, stress at first uh, unplugged activities and especially it works for like uh, this uh, uh, six, seven years old students, the teachers can be very uh, comfortable just to give like uh, several cards, tasks for 10 minutes, five minutes. And after then they can um, uh, be more uh, like more encouraged to do when, when they see smiling, what we got reflection from many schools, that when they see the pupils like, when they see uh, smiling kids, they thought, oh yes, we can start to do because we see that kids like, kids want to do. And if you wanted to go deeper to the teachers can understand what's how it's machine learning going, or artificial intelligence, or some uh, to use some uh, this, uh, materials, resources, then you need uh, extra probably um, maybe more more like five seven workshops that teachers can be more comfortable and then it depends you know as always and some teachers can go and uh, do it themselves and some percentage of teachers are hesitating to start but i think five two seven sounds at least in my eyes very attainable and achievable I think that might be a signal to go out and uh, get primary teachers interested and get them in computer science uh, workshops and uh, yeah, get it into schools and primary primary schools. 
Um, thank you so much. I think we've unfortunately already run out of time. Um, I want to thank you all for being here and sharing your resources, sharing your ideas, and um, yeah, of course, uh, interesting talking points. Um, I hope to see you very soon in different discussions, and we'll keep um, keep talking about primary education and um, yeah, of course, follow the Train DL project for more updates on the project itself. Bye. Bye. Thank you all. Thank bye you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all.